Okay, hi everyone. We're gonna start. Uh, thanks so much for coming. This is the third home homeschool talk of 2017. Thanks to Prestige for being here to do it. And thanks to S1, Felicia, and Alex for uh, putting everything together. And also for that party last night that was really fun. Um, I'm pulling up Prestige's bio to read. This talk today is called Art as a Context of Sport. And thanks to everyone for coming. In. Sorry, it's not loaded. <laughs> Let's get here. Lumumba is an artist, curator, and DJ living and working in Brooklyn, New York. His multidisciplinary work examines the element of context and its effect on subjective experience. In 2013, Pastiche founded the Lowe Museum and served as executive director for three years to the museum in Atlanta. He is currently a resident at the Blue Psychology Foundation University's year-long MFU Studio Pastiche Residency, where his primary focus is memes. Thank you, Pastiche. I need lots of protection. Time prior to that, I was you know, uh, doing this gallery, which an administrative position, and um, then being effectively homeless uh, for the whole of last summer. Uh, I didn't have a studio. I didn't have anywhere to like, make things. And when I did have space to do it, I was doing something else, and when I moved out of that space, I didn't have any space. So I would just be making things uh, on my phone. I didn't have any space to set up my computer at that time. Um, a phone and a computer. So that was mainly just things that Old people use Facebook. Okay. Um, that's what I hear from the kids. Is that <laughs> so? If you use Facebook right now, you're old. <laughs> um, but so when I got to my studio in New York, uh, I had all this time and space and all of the same shit that I was storing in basement and plan. So I got to actually make some of the things that. Uh, I've been thinking about and processing and thinking digitally for you know the past like, six months before that. So the first thing of those was this uh, brick. Uh, if any of you remember uh, Supreme, the like Gucci Pro pepper brand, uh, made this brick and they were just like charging. You know, it's a Supreme brick, so like now we're able to do that. And I just thought that was really funny. Just this uh, this idea of like roasting people, uh, something that I grew up with. Uh, I was in our group in middle school in Atlanta, and I just started doing that over the internet, uh, primarily on Facebook for a little bit, and then it became viral. So I have two presentations. But that's what I'm saying right now. I have two presentations. One of the IRL shit that I've been doing at Bruce for the past year, and then the internet shit that I've been doing continuously. 
my resident examples. So this is mostly the uh, plastic arts fine art context. Uh, so before I was, when I was doing my uh, administrative practice, I was conceptualizing this project, which is uh, basically like the intersection of the behaviors that we, uh, as like uh, society, deem acceptable for heterosexual masculine men uh, as it relates to like sports culture, like touching each other, like being like, in a locker room and doing whatever, like all of those things, being intimate, being uh, loyal to each other, and, like dedicated and like actually supporting each other, things you can do on a football field which you can't do like regularly. Um, relating those things to the uh, like practice, the sexual and just power practice of BDSM to like uh, think about these things as uh, power structures because you know masculine uh, patriarchy is a power structure. So uh, just kind of inserting the, that language explicitly into the relationships that we have in our regular daily life, like your norm, normie life uh, uh, to complicate you know, the relationships that people have with that uh, hegemonic culture. Um, and how it manifests in a lot of the aesthetics that I myself enjoy as you know, somebody who enjoys sports and you have like that. Uh, <laughs> I thought you were going to say enjoys media sound. And, and enjoys media <laughs> sound. So um, that's kind of just where I come from in terms of like putting things together in my art practice. And it also, people will see it just because it's the same thing. So those are kind of sketches, and this was like the thing that I made and showed last um, a couple of months ago, which is if you can see all of what's going on here, it's all um, graduated size sport balls in the shape of a uh, AMB. The first one is a loose ball, and a golf ball, and then a billiards cue, and a lacrosse ball, and a baseball. I want to make a larger one of these. It would be like floor size <laughs> basketball. Is good. Would it be more into? Huh? Would it be more into? No. Um, I don't know. I don't know about the basketballs. Because then it just goes into this whole like uh, large genre of like black dudes making work about basketball. Like, oh, I don't want to be uh, so the other thing that I was doing at Bruce was this class. I don't know if y'all can see it all of the text that's going on with you, just uh, correspondence. So I taught a class called Real Mega Hours uh, and or Curtis, if you are not, you know, of the black persuasions, many black persuasions, um, at the Bruce High Quality Foundation. It was an online class where we uh, basically tracked uh, contemporary culture and like critically discussed it community what was going on with me this uh, These are out of order, and there's two slides, but the first, this is like the first day of that class. It started in Black History Month, and this was, this bird was like, that was the shit at the time, which coincided with like just the anniversary of uh, another like shitty meme, uh, the like frog, like the what up. Uh, oh shit, that, that boy frog, which just like popped up out of nowhere, like conspicuously in Black History Month. Then I was just like, that was a joke last year, and it was like, that was a joke as well. And then also that Harambe was just like, not, nah, I was never like Anyway, um, so I won't show us too much of that class because it was like people's personal shit. But um, some things that happened in like, Fire Festival, which I'm done with, and being Campbell of Jenner. And so one of the things that like popped up as part of like my art practice in New York um, around the time where I was like halfway through this residency and also in Black History Month, I remember, um, which is always a friendship and super rich, was the Whitney Biennial Open. Uh, painting, uh, exhausting a lot of uh, in, in breath on 
around and all of this shit. But that was something that my critical voice got like shared through memes, particularly like uh, posted memes about it. And actually, super late. I was like maybe weeks late on posting my like, official memes for that shit because I was like talking about it on Facebook. Um, which, another thing I kind of want to stress is like to get off Facebook and get off, not, not get off just Facebook, but like all of these companies own your shit. Mm -hmm. So, like, my memes now are on my website. Um, and it was nice to see that it was cool. It's like sharing the, the live stream as my own website. It should all reroute to like your own personal shit because you're paying for it. Anyway. Um, so this was another one, and this was like kind of what, uh, a thing that I considered like all like a critical piece and an art piece and like all of the shit within one. Um, and so that's kind of where I want to go with my art practice. Uh, <laughs> bridging the gap between like taking all of these things that kind of exist, like brands and. Um, Things that like aren't really technically uh, public domain, but using them in a way that we use uh, images and memes. So like, this is somebody's handwriting, um, and this was like something that I made as a meme before. That's now like a, a large oil painting. Uh, and so that was like, part of my process of use, which is like translating shit that I made on memes into actual stuff. And so the next one, I think that, this is the last slide. Okay, so the next one that I want to do with that is a reaction to uh, the next one that I want to do is just do the other one with the same password. You zoom or else what else? What? You scroll down. That's the, that was the like, this like, critical practice has grown out of like talking to people on the internet, which I kind of have this pattern where I'm like, you know, pretty, way too calm, uh, like explanatory about like, talking like racist or otherwise made it's like on the internet about shit. Because a lot of them are people that you know and they happen to be in your network. So, like, um, people just say awful ball shit constantly. Uh, and I found it a lot easier on my personal like tax for energy, of which I don't have too much, uh, to just kind of like focus on things that you know I can have some kind of cathartic release on, which is maybe fun for people. Um, so this, I don't know if y'all have read all of this, but um, it's just talking about white people with dreadlocks. That's like a long debate or whatever. And the end of it, you know, is just like, what's next? Was fire started by black people also? And you can feel however you want to feel about black, uh, about dreadlocks, because it's, you know, whatever. But there, there are certain things that are just facts. Um, <laughs> One of these facts uh, is that like, life started in Africa, and there's never been a period in Africa where it just hasn't, like sub-Saharan Africa, where it wasn't black people. I, if, so, and, and fire was invented there, right? Like that's where it was <laughs> So, Black people invented fire. <laughs> that's like that's my <laughs> uh, logic on this, and this this is something that this will be like my next painting, which goes back into this like series of uh, I don't know like, truths, but Drake painting, and it's going to be an Alexander Drake one, just like things that um, 
I've had conversations that they lead to this like one small uh, bit of information that becomes the thing that is process uh, oriented and acceptable through the like capitalist art machine um, that can be girded with all of this stuff. So like keeping our seats on the internet so that when you know I present this painting, you know, like, the whole uh, picture. Anyway, so that's the shit on my art practice. Now, this is my main practice. Um, I'm starting here in the middle of my Twitter from 2016, April 2016, which is also late. Hmm. Okay, so this is kind of one of the things that I started being like con continuously paying attention to like memes. As, as they appear on Twitter and on Instagram, particularly, uh, was when Beyonce came out with Lemonade, which was the same weekend that Birdman did that infamous uh, Breakfast Club interview. If you haven't seen it, it's like a minute. Watch it. Um, actually, has, has everyone seen it? Yeah. Who hasn't seen it? Okay, so we're gonna watch it right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <coughs> it's a very brief interview. This is the whole interview. <laughs> and this was in February of 2000. And oh shit, sound good. The laptop is not sound. No, my laptop does have sound, but I think it's going out on HDMI. Oh, it's not of course. Oh. Hey, I'll do it on camera. Stop playing with my name. I ain't gonna say it on there. And Charlemagne is a uh, radio host who is like a gypser and just writes on the which I kind of enjoy. He's also a clown who says a whole bunch of dumb shit, but people get mad. Anyway, here's the interview. Just go on there, let's go. Stop playing with my fucking name. Hey, we'll do it on camera. Stop playing with my name. Let's I ain't gonna say it on there. Nigga, when my name come up, respect it. Let's go. Stop playing with my fucking name. I'll drill y'all. Stop playing with my name. I ain't gonna say it no more. Morning, everybody. It's DJ MV Angela Yee, Charlamagne the Guy. We are the Breakfast Club. We got a special guest in the building. He done cursed us out. Tell him, tell him, get it off your chest, bird man. Say it already. Tell him. Cause I, I don't understand the angle. Like what? Like what? Say it already. So I come here. I did it already. I'm here, so what's happening? I mean, it's all good, but I'm, I'm saying, why, why, why? Man, I'm here, what's happening? I'm all good, but I'm saying, why come here just to I'm here, what's up? happening, man? I wanted to see you. I wanted to talk to you on your man and your face. Absolutely. You understand me? I knew a few places you was at. I could have pulled up, but I don't thought that was gangster. I wanted to come look you in your face like a man and tell you how I feel. Okay. You understand me? Straight up like a man. So no what's the issue? issue? No ain't no issue. If it was an issue, you don't, you'll feel me. I just come to let y'all know, stop, put some respect on my name. You understand me? When y'all saying yeah. my name, put some respect on it. Did you, did you pull up on Ross that way or Trick Daddy? Man, I'm pulling up on you, nigga. <laughs> yeah. But I'm the radio guy. Why pull up on the radio guy? I don't act tough with the radio guy. I my nigga. Y'all, y'all finished or y'all done? I ain't got no more talking. Let's rock. All right. <laughs> uh -huh. 
are talking in interviews about how he doesn't pay his artists. He doesn't, yeah, he doesn't pay his artists. He says, like, if you want to get paid, you should sue me. Good business. That's why every little way I'll take someone to come out and like, in jail. Not to get into the politics of Birdman. <laughs> So that was like the funniest shit ever. <laughs> it just so happened to coincide with Lemonade coming out, which was also like a media firestorm that we're all familiar with. Um, and so people, uh, Twitter and Tumblr, which is kind of like a field day, that was like a, I was just like sitting in my room for hours just going through uh, all of this content. And began like, you know, feeling more like, oh, I mean, I could go through all of this, but I also have ideas about it. And like, I have four or five ideas about these two particular things happening at the same time that I can now insert my voice, like, pretty democratically into this large conversation that's happening. Uh, so, you know, I started making memes about particularly those two <laughs> things, and I made them. Uh, that weekend, like while I was, you know, saying that. So some of them were on Twitter, uh, and some of them were like very simple Photoshop things. And <laughs> this is just a flyer for the DJ set. So like a lot, most of my Twitter is memes. I'd say like 95% of it is memes, and then get the rest of it is just kind of, you know, stuff like that. Like, uh, promotional shit. <laughs> so I talk about Drake a lot. Uh, is, yeah, you know, <laughs> in the painting. Uh, Drake is a really funny intersection of like culture, geography, race, uh, cultural protectionism, propriety. He is extremely light skinned. Right? Um, so I talk about Drake a lot. That's, it, it, it might come up more. Um, <laughs> I'm going to go through some of these very quickly. Uh, so Frank Ocean <laughs> uh, had that movie come out that was like a movie and an album, and it was boring as fuck. And he came out with another album finally that was also boring as fuck. And uh, that's where like my handle came from. It was like art of 21. I don't really follow like twenty seven even. His his album was also boring, but um, <laughs> I guess um, I'm kind of done talking specifically about my shit because now I'm just gonna scroll through my memes. <laughs> if anyone has questions or anything that I brought up in this conversation, I'm gonna Atlanta's art scene is, there's a lot of 
room for DIY ventures and a lot of support, uh, but there's a lot of segregation racially, class-wise, and then what's the art scene in terms of where people get touched. It's not true. Uh, it's, it's mostly race and class, but the art scene is very conservative on the like, funding side, and then DIY, where people you know, do it. So, um, the Lowe Museum is kind of focused on uh, bringing those two things together uh, in terms of like the people who patronize both of those types of uh, establishments. Uh, because when I got out of school, our age people weren't showing. And even if they were showing, they weren't showing a particular type of art. And we're showing that the videos have art, which for me was like digital art and or like political or queer art. It wasn't being shown in a certain, like it was completely ignored by the like museum people. Um, they were very unaware. So the goal was to like do all of that at the same time um, while, you know, representing, you know, underrepresented communities by queer people. And just like being having a, a way, a method of doing things that was you know, consistent with our politics. Uh, in terms of whether or not that will continue, I like organizing. Um, that was a specific group of people. I would like to do something like it, but not the same. But I think it, it was very much uh, dependent on where it was and the, like, uniquely tied to. Atlanta's art community it was named, you know, kind of after the High Museum. So like the High Museum was like a Gucci large institution for like the antithesis to that. So I would like to do something like that that like responds to a specific um, ecosystem, but maybe not specific. Have you been uh, like what do the residents get roots quality? Have you been doing like curation too? Not necessarily. Um, I have selfishly enjoyed having a studio practice uh, and such a robust studio practice as well that I'm not and also you know like i went straight from low doing like heavy administrative work um, in a very small team to uh, having a studio so i was like i do now like i, I have things that i'm working on now but you know i haven't done any of that before Can you show us some of that practice or not? Which the studio practice you mentioned? Yeah, I mean that was uh, that was the stuff that I was Oh that was earlier stuff. Yeah, that was uh, all of the stuff in the slideshow before that was the stuff that I created that first. Do you have to like So this is kind of like a culmination of all of those things, like things that I've made digitally um, that come IRL, like trying to make them objects that span the gap of being like uh, produced in the way that I produce art um, aesthetically, and then also IRL and doing the same kind of thing. Uh, you know, when I shared that image, it was like, whoa, this is a cool image. That would be nice if somebody made that. <laughs> I have so many questions about this, but I can Ask one. Okay. Um, <laughs> just because I used to like, have <clears throat> yeah. um, I guess the most burning question that I have that might not really directly to you, but like really Designated onto your bike there um, was last October release that had you done Last October 2016? Yeah. Kenny Johnson uh, made a film Facebook Live, the previous director. Yeah. 
I know that this happened before y'all are here, but like it's an ongoing situation that people ask you questions about. Um, and Bruce uh, was made aware of that <coughs> incident, and they just, you know, that they have been nice consistent with their policy. That's the only thing that they told me. Um, oh, I don't know. I wasn't there yet. I was like, oh, wait, eight months before my was Yeah, do you have any more questions? I mean, what's it like? What's it like being raised? You don't live in your studio, do you? Do you like have a person live now? Uh, uh, no comment. What's <laughs> 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 well, that? Uh, school it felt like the place where you know I was learning things that were consistent with what I feel like I should be doing in my career. Um, which was like how to perform. Uh, and that, that whole class was just about how to perform. Get people on your side. Um, and the way it was structured, the way that we signed up for classes, the teacher, my teacher Sean uh, Kindy was, you know, it was it was set up in a way that like if if like it was very analogous to what I would be doing actually in my career. And I felt like, wow, you know, when I went into undergrad, it was just like, learn how to draw. And it's like, you can, you can know how to draw, but like, if you, you don't know how to like, sell your work, then like you'll just be a really good drawing person, which is great, but also can't. Yeah. <coughs> when I was there, there was not a lot of Um, with my class was exclusively black, um, but that was like a decision on my part. So um, the staff hasn't changed; it's gotten smaller. Um, you know, <laughs> particularly why I made space for you know having the class of mine, which was basically just like. Like people kind of get together and shoot the shit about you know whatever the fuck was happening with Ray J at that particular week. <laughs> <laughs> that is a problem. Um, not really my problem, <laughs> <laughs> um, but it is a problem. Yeah, Bruce Partaker with like everyone else or making uh, establishment. I personally didn't feel uh, too uh, isolated by Bruce, but I'm also not terribly sensitive, and I know other people have 
um, other people that I respect and are coming from very like valid reasons don't feel comfortable with Bruce and Bruce could be doing more of tech that um, are comfortable uh, for like black people specifically. Um, one thing that Bruce is far, and that's the other thing. Like when I was in LES, it was like you know, convenient to get from to from but traffic and now it's in the sense of art, which is uh, also catching fire in the last thing. The same people who own um, Pond City Market, which is this like old city hall turned mall in the center of Atlanta, uh, own Chelsea Market and, and Industry City, where Bruce is at. It's, it's done. Like, I, have, I have advertisements for Industry City on my Facebook. And uh, they've never been, I've never looked at anything for any different cities. It's like, you know, West Love performed there. Because mm -hmm. it's just like this you know, small Mexican and Chinese uh, neighborhood that is now a center of people going on there. So it's just like. reacting to your memes and or sharing them or altering them is like that kind of, you know, uh, ultimate engagement. Uh, I do like numbers as well, and that's really fun. Um, I do tend to like try to make things while they're happening so that, it, you know, the more, the more urgent something is, the more, uh, the more reactions it will get. But also, Particularly, like what happened with the Dana Schutz thing was the meme <coughs> community wasn't, it's like happens in this weird intersection of like art and then race politics where like I feel like satire doesn't really exist on the internet in a, in a way that it does say like on television with like the Colbert Report or you know, like the Daily Show, shit like that, where you can like talk to people and be like, I'm being funny about this fucked up situation, but I also have a very explicit position on that situation, um, which is weirdly difficult to do on the internet because of my like, tone and all this kind of stuff. And uh, I feel like that critical position is something that was not really existing in the meme form, um, particularly as it relates to art, because it does so for the rest of culture. And that was like the whole class that I had. Um, so the thing like the Dana Schutz controversy was uh, a particular moment where um, I was using this medium to express something that uh, everyone else is saying uh, in relation to this uh, incident. Um, and I know that it's uh, that not to make people which uh, was also just like a, a filling in a gap type of things, so like bringing that engagement to like this crowd of people and then bringing this engagement to them. Um, I don't know what this meme is I have one meme that was like, uh, reach out to likes on Instagram. It was about, uh, it, was, it was really simple. I just happened to tag somebody famous in it. And I don't know if they reposted it or whatever. And it just like fucked up all of my shit. <laughs> so, I don't know, it's it's nice to know that your shit resonates with people. I made some personal memes, like very specific personal memes, that, you know, people are like, oh my god, same, and I'm like, weird. <laughs> <laughs> but also, I, I, I can't say that I don't care, because I totally do, um, but I, I haven't cracked that code yet. And the thing that does like get me off is when people 
like engagement with them and have a long like conversation about like the nuances and shit. So like that Facebook post that I posted about like the why I think that turned into a weird like, long post and was also like got shared like a thousand times. <coughs> I think it's more of a funny thing than it is like critical. And so like for me my goal is to be both funny and so you come into it being like, I thought that was funny, and then like read the comments though. And then I do auto type stuff. I don't like doing hates a lot, but also it's fun to do it on your own page where somebody says something stupid and you're like, okay, I don't have to do it. What do you think with the studio towards like engaging with obviously works and really creating things that, you know, with the brick and the bulk egg and um, maybe to a certain extent the way that you handle, you know, oil and like the oil piece and the Drake font. Um, I mean, it's like there's a connection in my mind between the afterlife of the memes and how they behave and the after and or there's a disconnection between that and the afterlife of the artwork and like a physical art object and how it behaves, um, a more traditionally recognized artwork. Um, and I'm like wondering about like the importance of that criticality and that discourse and kind of that transmutability of the means as a digital form, and then whether or not you consider your physical objects also means. Or if they like, if they transmit that quality into a physical thing, and then how that behaves in the experience, like if those things are entering into a commercial space or not, or they're also being shared a lot as images themselves, so they're kind of returning to that new form. I'm wondering about in your experience of that, like of those various transmutations as you move into a different like mode in your. Yes, yes, um, yes. I do consider that Drake thing they mean, yeah. and I do consider the bricks and memes. I think they aren't like making memes and art isn't a new thing. I'm just explicitly relating it to more um, the capital M meme. Yeah, yeah. Um, and in terms of my internet memes, having propriety on the internet is very difficult. Um, and slightly antithetical to like, I don't know, the political climate that we like idealize the internet to be, which obviously it isn't, of course. Um, but I would, the thing that I've been thinking about more is being able to uh, have archives. So that's what the class was. Uh, the class was from February, February 9th to like April or something, we're going to have a document of uh, receipts, basically, of what happens in this particular lens um, as a way of like archiving, taxonomizing, whatever. In terms of just the like raw files themselves, um, I think about that all the time. I want, I you know, like I want to work with like, you know, things like electric objects to make a collection of memes something that you can get, you know, as maybe like a update or you know, if you subscribe to my memes on like Patreon or something. But I'm obviously not, still not working through another company to like membership. <coughs> um, as of now, my memes, when I update my website, which is not as up because because I update my Twitter or Instagram. Whenever I update my website, I put my memes on there uh, just to keep them there. But then they're still free for everyone. I would love to get paid for memes. <laughs> 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 the thing, the way that I want to do that. I was just thinking some people do get paid. Yeah. On the way that it's weird. They get paid on a different platform. Well, um, they're also a meme library. So. Um, yeah, there aren't that many of them, but it is a very competitive position to go on. 
I think there yeah. are some companies hiring mean people to try and update their advertising tra- strategies, Sibidates. like Gucci. Yeah. 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 Like, I hate it in a way that, like, yeah, I would totally do that. That's not just a job. But, like, I'm just going to take words from me and say, I would want to be a leader. It's basically like a political cartoonist or a son of a publication <laughs> that uses now memes instead of political cartoons, which I would buy that magazine. Mm-hmm. I don't know magazines. Um, you can mark your purpose. So that's the conundrum that makes that impossible. Like that's the Atlanta art scene. Um, and then when you oh, have a whole bunch of people making like cool shit and like you're like, oh wow, there's a thing that would be like if it was relevant, they would be like funding this kind of thing. Mm-hmm. That thing is not relevant. So like there's like maybe like three companies that fall on my axis of like both having enough money to pay a stack for writing mm-hmm. and then would also publish the shit that I'm saying. Mm-hmm. And then now like a thing starts giving me a job that doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I had a question about um, so there's two things that are difficult for people to relate to, like intense criticality, and then like context as a texture, or like thinking about context as a medium. I guess I'm speaking from my own perspective of like how difficult it is to frame a practice where context is the medium. Yes. And I'm thinking about how you're choosing forms that are like hyper relatable, like very mass media, like sports memes, not quite mass media yet, but online for sure. And definitely eventually in mainstream media would be massified. So I guess I'm wondering if like, that's obviously it's a conscious decision, but maybe you could explain why these media are so good for tackling these kind of unrelatable issues with criticality or context as a medium, right? Yeah. Um, because people are late. So, uh, you want that function. Yeah, I want I want people to relate to it. And I want people to relate to it on a very like automatic level. So that when you see that one, like I'm presenting you two elements, you try to keep it as simple as possible. Um, present you two elements, one that you're familiar with and one that you're unfamiliar with. And present them in the same exact context to you know, you know like how do these things actually relate because now they you know kind of have to because that's the you know game that I'm setting up. Um, context and what was the other criticality? Criticality. Uh, criticality is something that is like, so subjective that and um, that you know like the the ways where we where I come into like conversations to be critical about things. Like I like how you know, I'm having a conversation about art. It's not just like, oh, I made that thing and I put it in the gallery. If you in the gallery, you the context and being critical of that context when you're thinking at least about your art practice. In terms of people relating to criticality, I think it's the same, really. I, I don't think it's any less ego driven. Reifies their relationship to like whatever structure that they relate to. So like when people, when they ingest something, you know, like when people relate to uh, a kind of neutral standpoint, you know, it goes one particular, uh, one particular write-up that was just like we're gonna present all of the things that happened, and that's like what we consider like the index of journalism, you know, talking about the information. Um, I think people, yeah, people definitely align themselves with the level and type of criticality with which they feel comfortable. So, like, you know, the opera side of that, you have uh, the alt right on the internet, you know, like also, they can be some people 
relate with. Or there was one like motivational poster that I saw, and this was like from this year, like with all the motivational posters. Anyway, <laughs> 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 it was like it's like this you know white guy playing a hammer or some shit. It's like hard work or liberal let's call it a white privilege. <laughs> um, nice. And so seeing like the subjectivity of how people like uh, reify their values to their themes, I try to choose words for when I my statements, critical statements that are very much like attached to this other truth, this other contextual truth. So like the Drake thing. If you remember the line when Kanye says, you know, I even let this not let Sandrius come back and stop. If you understood that line when it came out, my statement is true, you know, <laughs> like Drake embodies all of these like post-racial aspirations of like, you know, being black, but then also like being able to say nigga, but like also like I'm kind of like Arabian maybe, you know, like and I'm also Canadian, which means like I American race politics don't apply in Canada, you know. Um, so I just want to like say these like uh, views instead of instead of using like a, a, a critical logical belief, it's like saying a, a thing that can be like verified as a fact. That's obviously not like that's more of a subjective fact, but it's a fact to me, you know. Um, in other memes or or like different discussions, I try to use like more explicit facts and explicit like like the Nike thing. That's what that's a Nike means sports or shoes if you want, but like sport you know. Um, yeah. The date sounds like it's better. And this is just like after the election. And like people lost their shit after Trump got elected. <laughs> and it was really funny to me. Um, I was not surprised. Disappointed. Because I am disappointed with a lot of shit. <laughs> but not surprised. <laughs> Like responding to something in an automatic fashion, like it makes me think of when we won our jobs, and like I, like I, as someone who doesn't know you personally, but who's been aware of your practice, like was not surprised. Like it's that kind of thing where it's like for some people maybe that would be like a spectacle or like an experiment, and instead it just seemed like your wheelhouse, like and. Show, and third show, third round, you have to make a 
the weird retrospective. <laughs> explain all these things that you've made in five minutes, not a Sea World hat with a you know, shark bite mark in it and a random time you trying to come. So, yeah, that was a lot of fun. Uh, I don't know. You know, like the people who they chose to judge, uh, my judges were. Jason Lennon, uh, Cliff Wiles, <laughs> Anna Fabrega, and Laura Larvieres. So like, these are all artists who work with comedy in their work and are you know, like, professionals at doing that. So like, it was, they were cracking jokes the whole time. And um, it created this environment where they were saying things that weren't necessarily, you know, like they were also true. You know, some of them were performing like others, but like, you know, making these statements about like the sometimes like the politics of what it means to be like a uh, white performance artist, you know, um, but also being funny about it. So it's like appeals to this entertainment aspect of what people might be going into this, you know, to view what class for uh, and being critical of not only the art world at the same time, but the the piece of shit that I just made, you know, um, but also playing along with this game of okay, I'm going to, I'm going to consider this by some set of logic that either I've perpetrated on the spot or you know, perpetrated for a period of time. Um, I don't know. I won that improvisation. Like that's the thing that I learned from the class was you know, being able to you know, make the thing and make it fast and also not care about the views and the objects. Because a lot of my artwork is like everything's precious, you know, material objects, material space. We created things in a studio for the past year and then like why? Because having space to store a five foot painting of some great text is a privilege um, that you, know, you can't really do with the amount of memes that I've made over the past year, you know? Um, and so <laughs> making, <laughs> making things in that, in that way is um, it's something that I think about. What, what do people who don't have so good objects or and how do you practice without having a lot of objects? Because I do want to sell art, but like, I would love to like get paid for saying the shit that I say through art and making these type of objects. but also are critical of hegemonic uh, structures around us. You know, like sacral memes, for example, also think about patriarchy or whatever you want to call it. And so I'm wondering, like, in, an, in this moment where it seems like we're really inundated, it was, I feel really inundated with, like, endless think pieces. Like, anytime something happens, like, everyone writes a, the same basic article, like, on one side, and then everyone comes out on the other side. And it's sort of this really masturbatory circle of text on the internet where no one's actually really saying anything. They're just trying to get the clicks, you know? And so I'm wondering if there's like a future for like real cultural criticism in the form of art criticism from specifically voices that maybe wouldn't, like not Roberta Smith, not Gary Saltz, but um, like how can, is there a future for memes as criticism to like break? And become a, like a, a real currency in how we deal with criticism. Like, could we 
use memes in a, in a uh, not just like a Bruce pedagogical setting, but like in an art school. Like, could that be, could people, could we ask students to respond to art with memes? Or like, how do you, like, how do you see it as, as potential in the future? I see it changing. I don't, I don't see memes like existing in the same way that they do now just because you know, it, it has to change. Um, the type of conversation, though, that you're talking about, like where people engage kind of critically. I feel like I don't have that conversation, that type of conversation on Facebook. In terms of it happening through memes, I think in order for things to be like a, a conversation in that way, uh, aggregation has to happen. And so, like, I'm not a coding person uh, too much or at all, really. <laughs> um, but that's another thing that I was thinking about is like how how something like know your meme uh, functions, but if it wasn't just um, <coughs> Cold dictionary factual and was more like culturally encyclopedic um, could function as that kind of thing. For me, the ultimate thing would be like having a minority report type scrub wheel where right? it's be like, okay, pull up like Pepe memes and then like all of the, the responses to that and you know, where all of the you know, points of conversation exist. <coughs> Currently, the only way that I do that is just like staying in bed. The Birdman Beyonce weekends, like where I, I woke up on a Saturday morning off from work and I you know, just just sat in bed like with me that for a long time. Um, I think I think uh, it requires like a lot, a lot of constant, constant work to like continually do that, particularly as it relates to like one uh, cultural thread. So, like a class was that um, that require like eighty million classes like that to actually understand some shit. Which I think is is doable. See like that's yeah that has um I think it's doable. I just think it, it requires <laughs> a lot of attention and like it's it's a job. People would have to be able to do that uh, as a uh, school. Yeah. Um, we're in schools that are hiring, you know, and then also it's a youth culture. So that's the other problem. Um, who's hire, Who's going to hire a 16 year old <coughs> to teach a class uh, on something seemingly silly that can evolve over a semester? Because my class, the syllabus, you know, Y'all asked for the syllabus, I was like, the syllabus didn't go in. <laughs> I had these ideas about what I was going to do with this class at the beginning, and I quickly realized, and then other things slowly realized, that that was not how it was going to go at all, because of the evolving nature of like, the platforms, the ways that we're having this conversation, the ways that we're having this conversation, and even on that, um, on that chat, um, you know, were evolved over a course of 10 weeks. So. Long answer to the short answer to your question would be like it's it's gonna change and we have to like figure out how to keep a lot of the changes. Um can you talk about your watermark petty images? Because I feel like <coughs> looking at how ungoogleable memes are, like if you want to find any then you like typing it into a Google search bar isn't gonna take you anywhere. <coughs> In the same way that like I feel like Getty images like um, infiltrates Google image and that kind of like overlap, or just like what it, the decision to go is. Yeah, um, that's something that I didn't I hadn't really thought about in that oh. way. Um, mostly just from the of getting confused with getting images. But um, watermarking is, yeah, it's really important. Particularly, I don't feel, I don't sign my artwork. Mm -hmm. Because my artwork is just like one of the, you know, like if somebody has one, it's, it came from me. <laughs> so, like, I know that, they probably know that. Um, and 
the, the petty images thing, <laughs> which is, yeah, just going back to like being petty and like also applying this kind of institutional looking uh, aspect to what what is an aesthetic that uh, I haven't used. So this was a particular one where, like, that was really funny. <laughs> A lot of people, when I posted that that morning, uh, <laughs> <laughs> some people were like, wow, it's just a situation uh, in Syria, like, I wish, like, people would uprise and, like, do some shit about it, and once somebody actually gets shot, we're like, oh my god, somebody got shot, you know, like, when uh, the brick gets thrown in our time, we tend to be like, that person is too extreme, but, like, in the past, we're like, oh, that was a really brave thing to do, like, to like, start that war. Um, so, we continue <laughs> with that meme. Um, and that was like a, a particular like, nuanced conversation mm -hmm. that happened, happened to happen on Facebook. Uh, as, in terms of the watermark, um, that's a really <laughs> interesting, uh, a really interesting idea to how to like keep propriety over your own property on the internet. Um, and I would probably need to do that with something that was less already attached to another. More powerful institution, but I mean, it functions that way in terms of like just people seeing their memes elsewhere, or, like being shared. I think it would be nice if people actually take like, a good position on memes that would just like at because that at is only again by Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, <laughs> so do you have any plans to start your own stock images site? Is that because I always thought that petty images was kind of fun on petty images, so it's surprising to hear you any thought about it. Um I have not, simply because all of that shit exists already. So like looking at like what this did and like making these like, weird stock images, it's like that's cool that you're doing it in a studio and we kind of have like studio stock images. Either. Yeah, doing weird shit. It's like, okay, almost anything that I need, and that that this is also going to be true for my main brand with a copy. Um, anything that I need to look for is that the images exist. 
if I need an image of somebody doing some shit, that person and that image exists on Google, I don't have to know how to find it, with the exception of black people doing shit. Um, which I'm kind of, not kind of, very big mad about. Because the amount of uh, additional search words that I have to type in to like, get a black body doing anything is fucked uh, up. And certain things that I'm you know, paying my name about are specific to black bodies. Um, so yeah, I would love to have um, more, I don't know, like maybe a database for that kind of thing. Um, this meme got like, the first time I interacted with like, uh, white, like, like, uh, like white people on Twitter, like angry white people on Twitter, uh, got into my, you know, shit about this. And I was like, <laughs> you know, I lost them like very quickly. I was like, this, I don't come to my Twitter to like interact with people, let alone like angry white people. So that was funny. Um, <laughs> I feel like I'm going on for it. Oh, I love it. Like, I keep scrolling. Um, yeah, I mean, I can go on forever about these memes. Uh, memes about gentrification. Getting the, you know, to close the home. Yeah. <laughs> That's weird about Portland. Also, so Portland, yeah. Yeah. Um, I made a like a status like, years ago, and like Portland is like the example of that. It's like white people, liberal white people living on streets, uh, named after black people, and they're famous for uh, fighting for their rights for white people. Like Portland is that. Uh, that's a pretty fast. That's the pretty fast. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is about a person, uh, Cash. I don't know. Um, Get Out was huge this year, like, and still is huge in terms of memes because it has. So that was another thing where, like, as an artwork, it touched on a lot of relatable points of conversation. So that, like, now, like, people use it as reference. Um, and I would want memes to be. Yeah. This was a, a hard image to find as well. Uh, black person, you know, on the sea, being like a military uh, uh, captain. I think she's a captain. Um, I, I, I went and researched the military ranks for this name. <laughs> <laughs> But when they made it, 
the Italian meme was already there. And I was like, that, come on, y'all. This, this had happened also in March. And so I don't know if I tagged him or somebody else tagged him and this meme on Instagram got like 3,000 likes. Um, and one like on Twitter. Twitter. Hmm? And one like on Twitter. And one like on Twitter. My Twitter has never popped off and it's private now. Because John's behind me on Twitter. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't know if y'all are ready for this. <laughs> 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 also, I don't know if I'm going to get hired by, I don't know, whatever, like, liberal, non that doesn't, like, challenge anything, like, not particularly conscious companies. And I don't know if you have to see any folks that have made this. Oh, did you make that one? Oh, <laughs> there are versions of that one that don't have your tag on it. Really? Yeah, that I've seen them, yeah. Where's all of these tags on white? Yeah. I see. Yeah. That's another thing. People like erasing your tag. That's so fucked up. Like, if you don't tag your shit or if you like crop something that's like weird, whatever. Like, unless you're like changing the image, you know, like, you know, And I don't take like internet. I spent a lot of Photoshop time. This is also autobiographical, like, I'm calling that on a big time for his birthday. And it wasn't necessarily a biographical but it did make a lot of sense. We're getting close to the question. And then the last thing that I was making a meme about was Jay-Z's. Jay-Z is one year younger. Jay-Z was born in the same year as Bobby Brown. <laughs> so that's that's all in my presentation. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.